Welcome to part four of the Age of Progressive Reform. Now we're going to talk about Theodore Roosevelt. Now, as far as progressives goes, William McKinley, yeah, he ain't one of them. He doesn't fit that mold at all, right? Remember, he was the capitalist candidate of 1896 running against the populist William Jennings Bryan, and he won that election. In 1900, he's going to stand for re-election, and at the Republican National Convention in Philadelphia, he's going to be selected for the Republican Party on the first uh, ballot. But there's a new problem. He needs a new vice, new vice presidential candidate. His vice president had been New Jersey Senator Garrett Hobart, but in 1899, Garrett Hobart died. So now he needs a replacement. Now, there's somebody that's already in, on the tip of a lot of people's tongues for his new vice presidential candidate, and that is the current governor of New York, a rising political star by the name of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt had become famous as his hero there in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, and he came back home and immediately began to spend that political capital that he built, right? He ran for the election for the governor of New York in late 1898 and won it and took that office on January 1st, 1899, where he immediately started to have problems with New York Senator Thomas C. Platt. See, he's the governor of the state of New York, but Thomas C. Platt is the power broker or the boss of the Republican Party in the state of New York. And he really cannot stand the way that Theodore Roosevelt runs the governorship because Roosevelt's a progressive. He believes in a hands-on executive. He said, like, that's not the way it's done. Laissez-faire, hands-off, right? But not Roosevelt. That's not the way he thinks that the executive is a source of power that needs to be utilized. So at the Republican convention, Thomas C. Platt is going to put Theodore Roosevelt's name forward to be the new vice presidential candidate. Now, Theodore Roosevelt doesn't want to be the vice presidential candidate. He can see exactly what's going on here, right? They're trying to shut me up. Remember, vice presidents don't really do anything, right? They go around, they kiss hands and shake babies. That's it, okay? Um, and so Roosevelt knows that. He knows that they're trying to shut him up. And so he resists this uh, being put on the ballot, but he will be put on. And whereas McKinley is going to be elected as the presidential candidate on the first ballot, Roosevelt will be elected as the vice presidential candidate on the first ballot as well. And even though he didn't want that position, you sure as heck don't refuse it, right? That is political suicide for you to do that. So everybody's happy, right? The Republicans are like, yeah, we've shut this progressive New York governor up. <clears throat> uh, Roosevelt still gets to build his political capital, even though he's just vice president. The only person really concerned here at this point is Mark Hanna. Remember, he's William McKinley's political handler. And he says, yeah, this is all well and good, guys, but what if something happens to William McKinley? William McKinley goes, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm healthy as an ox, man. I'm in great shape. Until something happens to him, right? What happens? Well, he got dead. On September 6, 1901, President McKinley's at the World Fair in Buffalo, New York, where he's going to meet this guy, Leon Cholgosh. Leon Cholgosh. And yes, it's spelt like it sounds, right? See, Cholgosh. Actually, this really isn't that hard. See, those Z's, pronounce them as H's, and you got it, right? So instead of uh, CZ makes the CH sound, and the SE makes a SH sound. So when you're spelling it, when you go the other way, just realize, just go Cholgosh, write that out, change your H's to Z's, and you got it right, okay? Or you got it probably close enough, okay? So Leon Cholgosh, who is he? He's an anarchist, right? He's a Polish immigrant, an anarchist, and he really can't stand William McKinley, the capitalist president, right? So at this New York uh, fair in Buffalo, he decides that he is going to kill the president. And at this fair, you got this big tent set up with a sign saying, come meet and shake hands with the president of the United States, right? And there's a whole line of people lined up to do this, including Cholgosh, right? Um, Inside the tent, there's 50 army personnel and their secret service agents, but they're not near the president because the president thinks it looks bad for him to seem like he has a bodyguard surrounding them, right? So we're not quite protecting presidents yet, but we're getting close, right? This, this assassination is going to finally uh, make the secret service more of a primary role, take more of a primary role in protecting the president. So Cholgosh walks up to shake the president's hand, or well, he walks up with a uh, handkerchief wrapped around his hand that's concealing a handgun, he reaches out and he shoots McKinley in the stomach twice. Now, 
Medical care had advanced since the assassination of Garfield, so we're not going to see the horrific things like what happened to poor James Garfield, but unfortunately, this is a stomach wound, and they are very dangerous, even still with modern medicine, and he is going to develop gangrene on the, uh, on the uh, outer lining of his stomach, right? And so at first, after he's been shot, it appears that he's improving until around September 13th, he begins to just take a downward spiral. And on September 14th, 1901, he's going to die from infection. This one, like I said, you can't really blame the doctors on this one, right? Uh, and Theodore Roosevelt, who actually was on a hunting trip in uh, New York, they'll have to send a messenger running into the mountains where he was hunting to tell him, you need to come back, you need to take the oath of office, right? So Theodore Roosevelt is going to become president of the United States. So as you can see, Theodore Roosevelt is thrilled with the fact that he's president now. And I'm just kidding. It's not like they didn't take this picture like when they gave him the news about McKinley. Okay. But Roosevelt now is a progressive president. All the things those uh, laissez-faire Republicans were fearing has now come to pass, right? He's kind of an interesting character, though, because uh, he's full of contradictions in his personal life, right? He's known as this powerful, imposing figure, but yet he was a very sickly child. As a matter of fact, doctors had said that he probably wouldn't survive to adulthood. He had acute asthma, which uh, in turn made him obsessed with physical fitness as a result of this, because he always saw his asthma as a personal failing on his part. It was his fault he had asthma. Now, we all know this isn't. True, that's not how that works, right? But it did make him obsessed with physical fitness. He's known as an outdoorsman and a hunter, but he's the first president who was born in a city. The reason why he had become such an outdoorsman is because his parents had actually constantly and often sent him out into the country, out into the, uh, uh, to the West to get what they called clean air, again, because of his asthma, right? And so he became a big uh, fan of hunting and things like that as a result of this. But he's a city dweller. Um, he's a progressive, right? He attacked uh, big business and he called them malefactors of wealth, but he's from one of the wealthiest families in the nation, right? He's a Roosevelt. The Roosevelt family is so big, so rich, and so influential that they have clans, right? He's an Oyster Bay Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt, who we'll talk about much later, is a Hyde Park Roosevelt, right? A different clan. Matter of fact, Hyde Park Roosevelt uh, Franklin is actually going to marry the niece of Teddy Roosevelt, Oyster Bay Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt. Matter of fact, they'll get married and uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt will give Eleanor away as sitting president. The president of the United States will give away the bride and he'll lean over the Franklin and jokingly say, I'm glad we're keeping the last name in the family. You can write the jokes that you want from there. Okay. Now he's also seen as warlike and aggressive, right? But yet this man won the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating the peace between Russia and Japan in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. So he's full of these contradictions, but he's going to change the presidency by referring to the White House as his bully pulpit. This is the way he put it. He goes, I suppose my critics will call it preaching, but I've got such a bully pulpit. And so he's going to change how government works. He's going to use the executive as an active force in governance. No more laissez-faire, right? For example, he's going to create the Department of Labor. He's going to work to break up trusts. He's going to create the Interstate Commerce Commission to control rail rates, and he's going to build up the United States Navy with the creation of what becomes known as the Great White Fleet. Now, Roosevelt, as an active, progressive president, is going to get involved in mediating the labor issues in the United States. This is something different. Typically, what we've seen thus far is that whenever the government gets involved, state or federal, with a labor dispute, they would get involved on the side of the industrialists. Roosevelt doesn't see this way, and the presidency is going to take an active involvement when it comes to dealing with the labor problem. In 1902, for example, the United Mine Workers is going to call for a nationwide strike in the coal mines, right? Uh, they're led by a guy named John Mitchell, and the demands of the United Mine Workers was that they wanted uh, the miners to have their days reduced to an eight-hour workday and a 20% increase in pay. And additionally, they also wanted the mine owners to recognize the UMW as an official labor union, okay? So these strikers all go on strike, coal mine production, uh, comes to a halt. This is a real problem in 1902. It's predicted that the winter is going to be relatively harsh. 
right? And so if you're not producing coal, then not only is that affecting the industry, that's affecting, uh, affecting uh, individual homes. You got these people in homes that use coal-fired stoves to heat their houses. Now they can't get cold. Now you got people freezing to death, right? So Roosevelt has to take immediate action. But rather than just send the U.S. Army in there or request the state government's militias to go in there and break up the strike, he calls the mine uh, owners and the UMW leadership to the White House. And by uh, invitation, it was, you will come here. Right? It wasn't a, it's like, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. Where he says, we're going to sit down and we are going to negotiate a settlement. He told the mine owners, he said, if you don't show up and negotiate, I will just have the government seize the mines and be done with it. Right? So these guys all, all get together in October of 1902. All right? Now, the UMW doesn't get all those demands they wanted. And Roosevelt said, you're not going to get exactly what you want here. But they got something. They got a nine-hour workday, a 10% increase in pay. And this is the first time that the federal government intervened on behalf of the public interest, right? Um, the UMW being recognized? No, they didn't get that, right? So you see Roosevelt getting involved on the side of labor. Here's a first, right? But these progressive presidents, it didn't always work out that way. For example, Woodrow Wilson, another progressive president, will have a similar thing happen in 1914 in Ludlow, Colorado. The UMW is going to call a strike in the mines there, right? But in this case, Wilson is going to allow the local state militia to just attack the uh, miners um, and destroy their little tent city. Uh, Wilson will eventually even go so far as to send federal troops to restore order and force the miners back to work. So not very progressive, not coming in on the side of labor in this case. But usually you're going to see these progressive presidents do side with labor in these different labor disputes. Now, finally, you see Roosevelt begin to go after some of these trusts. Remember these, like, for example, you had uh, J.P. Morgan had his oil trust, right? Um, uh, his standard oil trust, which controlled all the different oil industries that he owned, right? Um, now, Roosevelt's known as a trust buster, but it's kind of interesting. It kind of depended. For example, when J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller in 1902 tried to pl uh, plan a railroad monopoly called Northern Securities, Roosevelt's going to go after them hard and fast and break that up before it even gets off the ground. Things like the Beef Trust, he'll go after them. But he had motivation to go after them. And one of the reasons why is when he was there serving in Cuba, the Beef Trust were responsible for feeding the troops. And they had uh, sent them canned beef to eat. This canned beef, though, was treated with boric acid. And the reason why it was treated with boric acid, now they said it was to preserve it, but in reality what it was, it was rotten meat that they were sending to the troops. And the boric acid was just used to mask the flavor that this was uh, rotted meat. And as a result, you're going to have a lot of U.S. soldiers in Cuba get sick, and some will even die as a result of this, um, of this tainted meat. Roosevelt's going to remember that, and he's going to work hard to break up the beef trust, right? Um, other ones, though, he will leave alone. If the trust he doesn't seem as a threat to the common good, he will call, label it a good trust, and he won't go after them. So he's kind of picking and choosing when it comes to which trust to go after and which ones not to. Now, of course, Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller is going to be one that's going to be very high on his, uh, on his list, even though he's not going to be able to take them down. Another muckraker, an investigative journalist named Ida Tarbell, is going to uh, do another expose, much like Henry Dermarest Lloyd had done, uh, but she's going to do one in 1902, looking at Standard Oil and Rockefeller and referring to him as money mad. Matter of fact, she'll say, our nation, national life is on every side distinctly poorer, uglier, and meaner for the kind of influence he exercises. No price is too great to pay for winning. In commerce, the interest of business justifies breaking the law, bribing legislatures, and defrauding the competitors of their rights, right? So this is going to actually spark an investigation in 1905 after Roosevelt has won re-election campaign on what he called the square deal. In the square deal, he said, I'm going to give the American public a square deal. In other words, it was, his, it was a declaration of war against trust. Again, bad trust, okay? Um, so he's going to begin an investigation, and in 1906, uh, the federal government is going to begin a process of prosecuting Standard Oil. Now, Roosevelt is not going to successfully break up Standard Oil. As a matter of fact, his successor, successor William Howard Taft, will be the one that finally uh, will do it. And ironically, even though William Howard Taft is often labeled as not a progressive, and that's because of Roosevelt, he'll label him as such, 
Taft in his four years in office is actually going to break up more trust than Roosevelt did in eight.